I'm Kathy Elephant, and I'm a pharmacist at ISU College of Pharmacy. And I'm going to start with the epi section and then move into the first section, post-epi. Next slide, please. Okay, so just a, a quick update, right? We talked about malaria two sessions ago in the um, epi in the news or ID in the news. And so there has been one additional case identified in Florida. Um, and so seven in Florida, one in Texas. And there's a little bit more data that I was able to find that I think they just more recently recorded out. So this new case was reported um, fairly recently and they've identified spe the same species both in Florida and Texas uh, malaria and it's the Plasmodium vivax. And then they've identified a few risk factors, which I don't think we're gonna find them shocking, but um, for a couple of the patients, uh, individuals in Florida, um, they were adults who spent a sign significant amount of time outside, particularly at night, um, and they hadn't traveled anywhere outside of the US. The Texas case occurred in a South Texas county that was bordering uh, Mexico, and the person was identified as a National Guardsman who was working on a border security assignment pretty much before he was diagnosed with malaria. So again, outside, right, risk factors we would presume um, potentially at night or at dusk. And again, you know, just maybe more talk of climate change at least being playing a role in vector-borne disease. Um, obviously, the increasing temperatures, extreme weather shifts and such favor mosquito replication, which is then going to drive some of these vector-borne. So next slide, please. Okay, so this is kind of going along that same, I, I found this interesting, I've never heard of this. So Jamestown Canyon virus is also an arbovirus. So transmitted by mosquitoes, you can see. Um, there are actually two cases in Michigan, one in Oakland County, another in Macomb County of individuals who have tested positive for this. And the CDC states these are the first cases identified in the US this year in about 17 cases per year. But we'll see if this is going to increase as well. Um, most common in Midwestern states, although um, there's been mosquitoes in Pennsylvania that have been um, found to have this virus. You could see that most individuals who um, get infected with this Jamestown Canyon virus are asymptomatic, um, but, and, and we don't know, maybe there's a lot more people who are infected that are asymptomatic, um, but among patients who are symptomatic, some usually nonspecific, fever, headache, fatigue, um, some can have more respiratory, um, so, you know, cough, rhinitis, pharyngitis, and then more severe symptoms would be more neuro, um, including encephalitis, meningitis, seizures, coma. Um, the, the CDC does state that deaths have been rare, but sort of goes along with West Nile and um, other, um, some of those sorts of infections. So next slide, please. Okay. And we kind of talked about this in our group before we met last, or the last um, session that leprosy, right? And so you can find stuff. I mean, some people are like, oh, the CDC is saying don't travel to Florida. No, that is not the case. However, if you see individuals maybe who have traveled to central Florida in particular, um, there is an increase in leprosy. And so they've seen an increase in cases over the last several years um, with, in individuals lacking traditional risk factors. And leprosy has been seen in the US, right? But not very frequently. Um, however, like I said, the last couple of years, we've seen increases. Um, and it's also um, about 34% of the new cases um, are in Florida and very predominantly central Florida. So that's why they're kind of pointing this out. So they're kind of reporting, is it endemic? Um, but this, um, the case report that I've got on this slide was an individual who, let's see, he was a 54 year old male 
who sought treatment at a derm clinic, right, for painful and progressive erythematous rash. Um, they became, you know, more spread. Um, he denied any travel, any exposures to armadillos, which is where leprosy can actually be carried, right? Um, and he he works in landscaping, spends a lot of time outside. And so a lot of these cases in Central Florida lack any travel history and such. They're, um, you know, people not immigrating to the U.S. or anything. And his stains were consistent with acid fast bacilli that was consistent with leprosy. So it, it, it's, like I said, this is not new, but it's be, maybe becoming a little bit more prevalent. And so the endemic referral. So interesting though. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so doing a lot of infectious disease stuff, I thought that this was interesting, right? If we look at the world we live in right now, that air pollution, this study came out you know, a little, maybe about a week ago. So air pollution may contribute to a rising threat of microbial resistance. You can see some of the news headlines that I've pulled out. And so this was a recently published study through Lancet Planetary Health, and they actually sort of did a model um, and they demonstrated a connection between air pollution and increasing antimicrobial resistance. <clears throat> and so the model that they looked at, they looked at levels of air pollution um, and levels of antibiotic resistance in 166 countries. And the research, their research modeling, right, detected a correlation between high levels of air pollution and high levels of antibiotic resistance that they say, you know, could become worse over time. And we already have issues with antimicrobial resistance. And so their model um, showed that particle pollution, um, they believe, is a cause for about 11% of changes in average antibiotic resistance levels around the world. Um, they looked at specifically nine bacterial pathogens and 43 types of antibiotics. And they suggest that for every 1% rise in air pollution, there is a corresponding link to an increase of antibiotic resistance between 0.5 and 1.9%. And it was dependent on the, the pathogen. So it's something to think about as we keep getting worse air pollution, um, lots of fires and such, um, just all the climate change that we're seeing, right? And so I, I thought this was interesting. Okay, so next slide, please. All right, so just a quick look at COVID, right? You've probably heard in the news where people are saying, no, oh, it's creeping up a bit, right? Um, so you can see this is from the CDC. Um, the top data is through July 29th. And then the bottom goes through August 5th. And you can see on the bottom, you know, graph, if you look at the very end for where we are right now at the beginning of August, you see that slight uptick. And, you know, on the top chart, you can see that there's been a 12.5% increase in new hospital admissions for COVID. Um, next slide, please. So just talking about some of, right, this is constantly changing. <clears throat> and, you know, if you haven't looked in the, listen to COVID stuff lately. So we have a new variant. It's still an Omicron um, variant um, that tends to be, it's it's the more circulating strain right now. And it's the EG.5, and we'll talk about it a little bit more in a second. But just to kind of, you know, if you look on um, this chart side, you can see that over this time period, so kind of starting on 610, it's this yellowest, you know, and it's this is the model based on the very far right, but predicted here in this week, the latest re week report out, which was August 5th, and it was at a percent of 17.3, and you can see over these several weeks on the 610, um, 624, it was about 4%. So becoming more prevalent, um, but we still have our XBBs, right? So 1.16, 1.19, which have been the prevalent strains kind of circulating and 1.5. Next slide, please. And this one will demonstrate. So just to kind of point out, I, I like this chart that the CDC has on their COVID website. And so everything coming off here is basically the Omicron, right? And so this EG.5 is coming from the XBB Omicron variants. 
Um, so it kind of is going to follow that. And like I said, that to become an emerging more prevalent strain um, of COVID. And I, I kind of looked into it and it's not really leading. I mean, sure, it might be a slight bump. It, it really, they're not describing it as a surge, right? Any experts, um, it is very closely related to um, you know, all of these XBB variants, they might, there's a, a somewhat different change on the spike protein. So I saw there might be a little bit more immune um, evasion, but probably not enough. So, you know, if you've had the vaccines or, uh, and I guess more likely, and um, COVID at some point that you're probably um, pretty protected from it, from what I read, others may have other uh, opinions. Um, certainly hop in the chat or feel free. Um, but probably the vaccine currently has some efficacy towards it. Next slide, please. And this is just wastewater you know, testing that we've been kind of looking at. And you can see that um, we, there's about on the latest uh, data reported out on the bottom with the um, bar chart, 11% of the EG.5 in the Boise wastewater um, testing in the week of July 24th, um, but still um, XBB 1.9 and 1.16 still being the most prevalent variants at that time. Remember this lags behind, so probably expect to see it bumping some. Okay. And that is my last slide on COVID because some of the other slides that we've been using were not updated. So, okay, so this is just sort of a teaser. Liz and Sky are going to talk more about this. I'll give you a lot more information. But, you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about Canada Auris. Um, it has actually been around for some time now, 2013, I think, when it was first truly noted in the U.S., but really 2016, where New York City was sort of known as the hotbed. Um, but we'll find, we'll see that they'll talk about COVID, what's emerged more. And now Canada Auris has been found in at least 29 states. Um, it's a fairly significant Canada species um, that I think sort of just on its own, it's multi-drug resistant. And you'll see that um, fluconazole res resistance is about 90%, amphib B resistance about 30%. This is from the CDC website. It's not fully up-to-date information, but a lower risk of resistance to the echinic candidates at about less than 5%. But stay tuned for more on this. Okay, next slide. Okay, and I think I have the first two. Okay, so just kind of wanted, since we're talking about yeast, right? Fungus and mungus and stuff. Um, and the changing distribution of our dimorphic mycoses, and we're gonna talk specifically about histo and blastomyces. And, you know, kind of traditionally, um, I'll show you some maps, but I, and I didn't, until I started digging into this more, a lot of our traditional knowledge is coming from like the 1950s and 1960s, right? So that's pretty old data. And as we kind of look at what's been changing, you know, for geographic distributions, endemic type um, pathogens, these as well have changed in their distribution. And so this study um, out of clinical infectious diseases, and it's a recent study, from April of 23, but they wanted to see, you know, is that change, were there changes in that traditional geographic distribution? And there are definitely flaws in this and who it's focused on, but this was a Medicare population. So anybody over the age of 65, right? But they did a retrospective analysis of more than 45 million Medicare beneficiaries from 2007 to 2016, as you can see. And they looked at it they were looking for certain thresholds and they defined incidence as 100 cases per 100,000 person years for histoplasmosis and 50 cases per 100,000 years for blastomycosis. And they found that there were almost 80,000 histoplasmosis diagnoses in that time and just over 6,000 blastomycosis diagnoses in unique individuals during that time frame as well. And that they 
their conclusion, and I'll show you a couple slides, their geographic distributions have changed very significantly. So we can hop over to the first slide that I've got kind of showing. And this will be on histo. Okay, and you can see, so the top um, slide or the top map is what we had thought of traditionally. And histo, um, traditionally um, living in central and eastern states, particularly around the Ohio and Mississippi River Valleys. I did my ID fellowship in Chicago in, in early HIV. And we always thought about histo and blasto, right? Potentially in those individuals, because just due to proximity, we don't talk tons about it. But if you go to the bottom map, this is demonstrating what they found in this study. And granted, it's a skewed population, but okay, some of these could be um, acquired early in life as well and then can present later. But if you look at this, um, and why is this important? Well, as you start looking at clinical diagnoses, right, um, you can see on um, they found at least um, one county and 94% of states had a histoplasmosis diagnosis pretty significant change, right, from that top map. And it's important because that expanded distribution, right, it can maybe help focus in um, being able to diagnose maybe more rapidly because maybe people aren't thinking about it, right, as clinicians are evaluating patients in the differential. And you can see that traditionally there's been about an average of a 40-day delay in diagnosis of histo. Um, so maybe knowing that Huh, even though my patient doesn't come from these high risk areas, knowing now that it has pretty wide distribution, I might be more apt to move that maybe higher up on my differential or something. Okay, next slide, please. So this is blastomycosis, and you can see that it, it's not quite as prevalent, right? Um, that it was just over 6,000 cases, but at least one county in 78% of the states um, had a diagnosis of blasto. And again, you can see that pretty widely distributed compared to what we think about um, traditionally Great Lakes, uh, Mississippi, um, Ohio River Valleys, and kind of the St. Lawrence River, right? And again, there was a delay traditionally of diagnosing it. Oops, okay, spelling. So month delay, a month delay of there. And hopefully this Again, we'll maybe focus your differential. If patients are presenting maybe with some signs and symptoms, it may be it, but knowing now, it's a pretty wide geographic distribution. And that is all I have. Sorry. I lost my mute button, unmute button for just a minute there. So um, thank you, Kathy. I, um, yeah, gosh, those maps are fascinating. Having sat through medical school and thinking about, oh, I've like never lived, um, never lived east of the Rocky Mountains in my entire life. And I only needed to worry about coccidiomycoses. Um, and that is certainly not the case based on that. And maybe a good take home for, for that and for what I'm about to chat about is fungal diseases, if you don't look for them, you're not gonna find them. Um, uh, and so good for us to keep in mind. So um, in this like fungal potpourri that we're gonna chat about, um, I think the other thing we found as we started looking in like what's new in the world of fungus um, is that recently there has been more data about fungal diseases and co-infections with COVID-19. You know, we're sort of starting to be um, far enough out that there's actually time to have analyzed data um, in that setting. So we're going to um, chat about this for a little while um, and hat tip to Verena who is unable to present but certainly helps um, prepare these slides and, and think about what content from them would be super helpful. So, um, Big picture, uh, the bullet point on the top is really that um, hospitalizations involving fungal infections has increased, you know, by almost 9% um, each year since 2019. And you can see in this graph, the orange is fungal deaths with COVID. Um, and even independent of that, the number of fungal deaths has increased in our non-COVID patient population. So we are going to focus on our COVID patients because that orange bar came out of nowhere. Um, concurrently with the pandemic. 
Um, but important to keep in mind really that I think uh, probably a large part of strain on the healthcare system has contributed to an increased risk of um, invasive fungal infection. So we're sort of, I'm putting my inpatient hat on and we're gonna talk about sick inpatients for the most part in, in this category. Um, we also know that, you know, starting six months into the pandemic, we were giving steroids. Um, and for a long time, we've known that steroids put people at risk for um, fungal infections because it does um, suppress their immune systems. Um, and then I think the last big bullet point, right, is that patients with COVID-19 who have fungal infections are more sick. So they have higher in-hospital mortality rates, they have higher rates of ICU stays, they're in the hospital for longer, and they have increased rates of mechanical ventilation um, that is probably both associated and causative um, of some of those fungal infections. So uh, when we look at sort of the co-infection of COVID-19, we're gonna talk about three of them. You probably should have in your mind like the risk of fungal infections across the board, but you can see in this graph, this nice orange bar here is our aspergillus. Um, the next gray is candida. And then this is a, you know, all bit smaller um, as part of this. And then that big red is the other and unspecified, which I actually think is helpful to keep in mind because a lot of times we say, gosh, we think this is fungal, but we're not able to identify um, what we think this is. So again, sort of mapping out, you can see this um, sharp uptick starting in 2020 um, with our COVID-19 pandemic. And the three that we're gonna talk about today, um, the top one and the bottom one, I would say are super pertinent to our patients here in the US. Um, and the middle one I think is good to keep in mind, but it's probably more related to global pandemic issues than necessarily the US. So um, we're gonna talk about pulmonary aspergillosis. We're gonna talk about mucor and candida. Um, you can see the incidence of both um, aspergillosis and candida. I mean, are as high as a third of patients who are, um, who are super hospitalized in our COVID patient population. Um, so that is crazy, right? Those are our, again, our sort of comorbid ICU patients have massively high rates of fungal infections in some prevalence studies. Um, and then that rate of mucor is lower and that is really data nationally. Um, I'll talk more about, about that piece of it. So let's break them up into, um, into three different chunks. And we'll start with COVID-associated pulmonary aspergillosis. Um, so we all uh, have thought about these fungi before, and hopefully we will continue to think about them after COVID. Um, but thinking about your COVID patients uh, who are then hospitalized and admitted um, and then develop aspergillosis, it's a pulmonary invasive infection. That's where we would look for it. Um, and you can see they need to be on sort of our heavy hitter azole, voriconazole, or isobuconazole um, as part of that. The um, next slide I wanna think about is what does that look like? So what is the clinical picture of someone who has COVID-associated pulmonary aspergillosis? So I say broadly worsening respiratory symptoms or status. And the majority of our aspergillosis patients are admitted in the ICU, critically ill, um, and then we, in real time, um, acknowledge that they have worsened clinically, get repeat imaging, rebronk them, look for some sort of clinical worsening picture um, and identify the aspergillosis. Uh, this case actually um, sort of publicly accessible on Radiopedia, like a great resource for when you need like a perfect classic imaging, that patient actually went home. So was admitted to the ICU, got our therapies for COVID and then discharged home and had sort of worsening dyspnea at home and came back with lungs that look like this. Um, so I think even though I'm seeking most of these fungal infections, invasive fungal infections are happening to our patients who are already in the ICU and still under the care of an inpatient team. Um, for all of those primary care doctors, I don't want you to ignore the fact that if your patient was admitted, received high dose steroids because of their COVID, received tocilizumab because of their COVID and then discharged home, and then they have worsening respiratory status. Keep this on your differential. Um, I think the radiographic signs are helpful, both for aspergillosis and then all fungal infections, right? So the halo sign not indicated on this, um, this picture here, the halo sign is a nodule with brown glass opacities around it. 
Um, whereas this, what we're seeing are some cavitary lesions with fungal ball in the middle, that inner cavitary mass. And in the case of both that inner cavitary mass and the nodule, that is like a fungus ball that if you biopsy, look at it under a scope, you'll be able to identify what it is. Um, so either one of those fungal balls on imaging, no good, not always indicative of aspergillosis, so it certainly is the most likely, um, and, but should make you think of fungus regardless. So let's talk about risk factors um, and why people are really, why people are getting aspergillosis. So this is the first of three of these sort of risk factor diagrams. So we're, I'm gonna walk you through at least what it looks like. You can see these major risk factors are these ones that are more bolded or more, um, uh, deeply shaded, whereas the little evidence of risk factors that certainly have a theoretical risk factor, right? When I was in medical school, this is like what I learned were risk factors for aspergillus um, pre-COVID. But these are our sort of known risk factors. And then I think other helpful things to think about, they identify your low income risk factors, low income country risk factors versus high income country risk factors. Um, uh, and then the major risk factors identified with this big exclamation mark. So I think this is helpful for us to think about, right? What is the treatment for inpatient critically ill COVID patients? It's dexamethasone and it's tocilizumab. And we give that because it knocks down our immune system, but that is the risk factor for aspergillus. Um, and then thinking about this set of patients, right? The people who have been on steroids to begin with because of their underlying COPD um, are, are then also at increased risk. And the um, pathophysiology of this really is that the viral picture probably causes some epithelial lung damage. Um, and then those damaged epithelial cells in the parenchyma um, are just at much higher risk of getting globbed onto by fungus and letting that stay. I think the ICU stays and mechanical ventilation, we have always known patients are, you know, more critically ill, more immune suppressed um, as part of that. So these are the patients you wanna think about in particular for your aspergillus. And you'll see there's a decent amount of overlap between this set of patients and others um, in the other fungal, fungal uh, diseases. Um, before I move on to mucor, does anyone have any questions about um, COVID acquired pulmonary aspergillosis or does Sky have anything he wants to jump in with? No, uh, nice. And I'm monitoring the chat. I don't see anything in the chat as of yet. Okay. Okay. Great. I'm just going to keep pausing for questions um, uh, to make sure we cover it. So let's talk about COVID associated mucor. And I think the reason this got um, uh, this got some headlines and um, and is on the forefront of people's minds really is not the state of the U.S. but in India. So during India's um, one of India's massive surges, they also really had a, a massive surge of this necrotizing um, fungal infection. And the rates of mucor are much higher in India than they are in the U.S. sort of at baseline. Um, so that is, they were probably primed and ready for it. Um, but that is like sort of worth thinking about. And I think there are some good take-home points for even our patient population. Um, so again, neuchromycosis, the, the main bug is our rhizopus species. Um, in terms of the infectious sites, I think about pulmonary, I think about um, your like uh, rhino cerebral orbital um, should get added to this gastrointestinal picture. Um, and the key in identifying your infection site is that it really is like a locally invasive, locally necrotizing site and you almost always need a biopsy in order to identify it. This is not something you can just get a washing and hope to identify. Um, you really need to go in and get surgery, which is part of why um, it is such a brutal, uh, brutal invasive fungal infection because ultimately the same goes for treatment. While we lift um, AMPHO-B here as a treatment for it, really the, um, the full treatment is surgical debridement, which often leaves people fairly disfigured um, or without parts of their lung. Um, so not a uh, fungus to recommend. Um, happy that our rates here are lower um, than those in India. And we have, uh, as of yet, I think, not seen um, the rates in this country that they did over in India. And then here are the risk factors. And I think um, this 
part of this uh, really hits home the fact that, you know, we in our high income country without baseline um, uh, mucor infections um, have somewhat avoided it. I think the two points worth, um, worth calling out here are the sort of hyperglycemia and diabetic ketoacidosis picture. So we have known um, in our non-COVID patients when we worry about mucor, those folks who are sort of chronically massively hyperglycemic or living in and out of DKA um, are some of the patients who we worry about with, a, um, with mucor. And so I think thinking about, gosh, if, um, if I was taking care of a patient, you know, we are giving them a bunch of steroids, right? That's going to definitely immune suppress them. Those steroids also drive people's blood sugars up. Um, so anything I can do to keep them sort of euglycemic during their hospital stay probably reduces their risk of that. You can see also here the sort of our patient populations in addition to our hyperglycemia, um, but our solid organ transplants and our malignancy. So these are people who really have no cellular immunity, and then we are throwing steroids at them and giving them tocilizumab to treat their COVID. That's the patient population who's going to be at risk for mucor. Um, I think big picture takeaway, euglycemia is always the answer to taking care of patients in the hospital. Um, and if you see a necrotic, uh, necrotic sort of uh, rhino orbital picture um, or pulmonary picture, you're probably going to try and get a biopsy of that because, again, diagnosing fungal infections is not an easy thing to do um, and involve your ID colleagues early. Okay, uh, I see one question. Um, oh, a great question. Fungal infections in mind as outpatient providers, what is the time frame post steroids to see fungal infections? Um, you know, I think you probably, oh, Sky looks like he's unmuted to jump in there for me. Oh, no. Um, well, a couple of things uh, I'll just, you know, mention on this, both aspergillus and mucor, you, you know, you highlighted the, the, um, the clinical uh, aspect where you get necrotic lesions. And, you know, the way I like to think about it is these are angiophilic. They like to get into the blood vessels. And so as they get into the blood vessel, you create local ischemia. Uh, and so you uh, leads to necrotic lesions there, but it also limits the ability to get antimicrobials into the area if you have uh, blocked uh, blood vessels. Especially with mucor, it uh, pretty rapidly gets into the blood vessels, infarcts the tissue, and then is able to you know, survive in the necrotic tissue very well. Um, so that's the same sort of aspect that I think you would think of, you know, and, and when these are going to present. The, um, the risk factor of the steroids, you know, we like to think that those effects are probably two to four weeks after you even discontinue the, uh, the steroids. Most of the time, the disease process has started uh, before those steroids are, are discontinued. What you can see sometimes though, is an increase, almost a paradoxical increase in your inflammation once you go down on your immunosuppression. So it's something that was sitting there, um, uh, you know, quietly invading tissues now has a lot more inflammation on it. Uh, clinically, what I've seen as mentioned is you can have a secondary, you know, spike in symptoms uh, after discharge from the hospital. Uh, mucor often is still um, presents while they're still immunosuppressed, and you see it because of the, the necrosis and the inflammation. So I'd roughly say, you know, you got a, a up to a month after uh, hospital discharge, and, you know, again, two to four weeks after discontinuing of immunosuppression. After that, it's not that you can't see it, it's just gonna be a little bit more subtle. And uh, in fact, I've seen a small lesion for aspergillus months after, but you don't have the rapidly progressing disease like you saw in that CAT scan. It's kind of a, a nodule that is playing off in the immune system and just kind of staying um, uh, almost quiescent or, or stable. Awesome, thanks, Guy. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask um, 
the follow-up question, same, roughly the same time frame for tocilizumab and baricitinib, um, which are sort of our other backbone agents for our critically ill patients. Is that the same picture that you think about two to four weeks as being their highest risk? Um, yeah, baricitinib has a, a, a shorter half-life and it's an oral agent that's given daily. Tocilizumab is one of those longer acting um, uh, agents that once you give that, you may have effects uh, you know, for a month or more uh, afterwards. But I think the same thing clinically is that you, uh, if you're not going to see that early on, I think the risks of seeing something, you know, down the road uh, are a little bit less. Cool. Thank you. And great question. Okay. We are going to move to our last COVID-associated fungal infection that we're going to talk about, which is candida. And Sky's going to talk a little bit more about candida in, um, in just a couple minutes. Um, but calling attention to the fact that candida in COVID, we've seen, you know, the spectrum of candida infections, both albicans and also as bad as oris. Um, I think about the risk factors for candida and we'll, I'll click to that risk factor piece um, in just a minute, right? But I think about our ICU patients um, sometimes have parenteral nutrition with a known um, central catheter, um, a known line, um, sort of sets people up for their candidal infection. Um, you can see bloodstream is the prior or is the big piece of it. Um, and abdomen, I think what is notably missing on that is pulmonary, and I think that's intentional. So we see bronchoscopy in these really sick patients, um, sometimes comes back with candida. And I think Sky would probably echo that often that's thought to be a contaminant sort of hanging out in the ICU. Um, and that really we worry about the invasive disease when it's in the bloodstream or other tissue, um, but not sort of on our BAL specimen. The recommended therapy here is in part because I think we're seeing more and more candida resistance patterns. And I think um, while I, my certainly go-to is, oh, I assume most candida albicans will be, um, will be uh, sensitive to my usual agents, I think making sure that we're thoughtful about whether or not we need to do some resistance testing in these candidal infections. You can see this set of risk factors looks very similar to the aspergillus. Um, so I think in our when they look at the epidemiology data here, we see a little bit more of a clear HIV um, risk factor that like bore out in our data. Um, you can see prior antifungal exposure for candida oris. Um, or broad spectrum antibiotic in, um, exposure for candida oris and sort of our older age and malignancies here. But again, these are your ICU patients who have received tocilizumab, who have received your corticosteroids, um, so are heavily immune suppressed. Um, and then I was looking here, oh, here's our central venous catheters um, picture of that. And, and I think for all invasive candidal um, and bloodstream candida infections, I think about you know, parenteral nutrition as being um, a really big risk factor. So thinking about um, just sort of some big picture management strategies for these three COVID co-infections. Um, for our aspergillus, right, I think careful screening of your COVID patients who have ARDS, who are sick and in the ICU, if they have worsening um, respiratory symptoms to keep this on your differential. And then I think also making sure that your aspergillus is getting um, tested for sensitivities to make sure you're using the right therapy. I think this MUCOR picture, uh, the best way to avoid it here in the US where it is gonna be a extremely low likelihood is really to do optimal glycemic control. That should be standard of care for all of us. And then for our Canada, um, again, I think thinking about antifungal susceptibility testing to sort of optimize treatment um, without breeding resistance. And I think um, the big piece here on this, uh, for all of them, right, I think, um, Yes, dexamethasone has saved many, many lives in our COVID patients, um, but I think recognizing uh, that while steroids make patients feel better and make me feel better in a lot of different ways as I'm taking care of them, um, just recognizing that they do come with, you know, with possible, um, possible negative outcomes for our patients down the road. And then... I just have this last sort of key points, I think, with our COVID-19 associated fungal infections. So I think the risk for fungal infections, 
grows with a level of acuity and treatment courses. So the longer your patient is in the ICU, the more heavy treatments they've received for their COVID, the higher their risk factor is going to be. I said diagnosis may be challenging, but cross-sectional imaging can be helpful. Um, if uh, you have a low level of suspicion, I think recognizing that it will help you um, sort of uh, navigate that. And then I think um, uh, this goes without saying, like, I have taken care of patients with our invasive fungal infections and COVID at the same time, um, but I do it always hand in hand with my infectious disease consultant. And I'm sure Guy would echo, he is happy to receive consults when there is a question for an invasive fungal co-infection in your COVID patient. That is, that is a time for, um, for expert help to, to come into play. So I think that is all I have, unless there are other questions or if Sky wants to jump in with anything else. Uh, no, excellent uh, presentation. And, and I think a lot of the Canada stuff, you know, maybe as time uh, permits, I will just talk about uh, candidemia and, and candidiasis in general, uh, along with our, our first case. So cool. I'm going to mute and give, give the reins back to Jocelyn for slide control. Thank you. Next slide. Great. Um, so again, I apologize for not having my camera today, but uh, hopefully you all can all see me and, and look at the uh, slides. Uh, this case, 68-year-old uh, male, you know, traditional uh, 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 multiple comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, and end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis, but it also had laryngeal cancer and, and currently had a chronic uh, tracheostomy. Um, he developed uh, bronchitis. The uh, sputum tracheoaspirate was cultured. And as um, uh, uh, Liz had mentioned, we often see a lot of different organisms and it had oral flora and uh, yeast. But then the yeast was identified as Canada aurus. Um, next slide. So we're going to, you know, talk a little bit about this organism because it certainly is catching the headlines. Well, a little bit about risk factors, you know, uh, treatment necessary in this case. And if it is, what do you use? A little bit more about susceptibility testing. And then, you know, a big one is what infection prevention strategies uh, should be used. Next slide. So this certainly, as uh, uh, Kathy pointed out, initially is in the headlines. And it, it's been um, so-called darling of, of uh, science writers for a variety of reasons. It, it um, has been considered this deadly uh, uh, fungus uh, and can certainly add to morbidity and uh, mortality. But it's also a, a, a new organism that just kind of burst on the scene, you know, nearly simultaneously in, in three different continents. Uh, from that, it has spread, um, as this one article said, to 33 different countries on actually, you know, four different continents. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, why that might be, because it, it's an uh, interesting conjecture on uh, what might be going on. Uh, next slide. Uh, but before I get any further, I really want to uh, highlight a couple different uh, articles and guidelines. Uh, the most recent one has been 2016 from the IDEA essay on uh, guideline for management of candidiasis. And, and it's really good uh, document. And a lot of people think it's, it's due to be updated uh, because a lot has happened since uh, 2016, but a lot of the recommendations are still uh, a real solid. And I'll talk about a few of the nuances um, and caveats as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, European guidelines, uh, very similar, and I'll highlight just one of the uh, nuance uh, differences, uh, but this one is from 2012, and they uh, look at it slightly different, and they're uh, both pretty good reading as far as their evidence and data review. Uh, next slide. Okay, so Canada Oris. Uh, 
the CDC is also a, a wealth of information, both for uh, clinicians, infection preventionists, uh, and the general public. And so uh, highlighted that here. Next slide. So out of, off the CDC website is also uh, this description of, of where this all started. And nearly simultaneously, um, uh, we saw the identification of a novel species of uh, Canada um, in Venezuela, uh, South Africa, India, and Japan. Uh, from there, the United States uh, cases can be tied to uh, one of the or more of these different uh, clades, so to speak, uh, from different areas of the country as our global um, you know, travel and you know, the world is shrinking with um, uh, travel and uh, uh, human as well as uh, livestock, birds, um, and aquatic mammals uh, throughout the world. Uh, next slide. Since its identification um, uh, you, in the United States, it has increased fairly steadily uh, and has been reported in uh, the states, as you can see here, the darker the discoloration, the uh, more uh, uh, cases that have been identified. Uh, not any reported in Idaho or uh, Pacific Northwest uh, as of December 31st, uh, 2022. Next. Okay, so this is where I want to jump into kind of the whys of all this. And it, it really um, uh, ties into a couple of the themes that we've uh, discussed in this uh, forum uh, before. One is climate change, um, and there is a tie-in here. And one of a, a fairly compelling uh, hypothesis is that this organism uh, has uh, developed an increasing tolerance uh, uh, to temperature. The, the oceans have been uh, warming, and this has been identified on the skins, uh, skin of dolphins. Uh, it's closely re, uh, related to a, another Canada species, which is, uh, was first identified in the, um, the aptly named grunt fish. Uh, so it, it has had a, a, a tie to aquatic environments, wetlands, and given that can also be carried you know, with migrating uh, birds. And the three, uh, four different areas where it was identified have all have uh, coastlines. Um, and except for uh, South Africa uh, are fairly temperate um, in, in some of the areas where it's uh, been identified. And so the slowly warming uh, oceans could slowly allow the selection for an organism that before did not uh, replicate well at uh, warmer temperatures, i.e. Uh, body temperature. Uh, next slide. When they looked at uh, the temperature some of these uh, grow at, you can see that the Canada orus has, you know, apart from uh, the closely related species, began to uh, replicate more easily in warmer temperatures. The Canada hemulonus, as well as the uh, renamed Canada lusitania, are other uh, Canada species that uh, are seen in uh, human disease. So uh, this change in incubation temperature uh, and increase in human disease can also be tracked in other environmental pathogens such as uh, the non-tuberculous uh, mycobacteria. And uh, I haven't looked at it, but I'm also suspicious that we might be able to see this also in um, mycobacterium um, uh, leprosy as well. And so those sort of changes uh, uh, may affect you increase in human disease uh, also. Um, and so once this occurs, 
then you can see the uh, spread, especially in uh, hospital environments uh, and in patients with increased comorbidities. Uh, next slide. So uh, uh, Canada Oris uh, has been identified and it is tied loosely to one of the heat shock proteins that may be associated with this increased uh, uh, thermal, um, uh, you know, ability to grow at higher thermal uh, temperatures, that it also has some ability for uh, drug resistance. And um, it can routinely be resistant to the triazoles of which fluconazole is, is one of the highlights for Canada species. And if not aware, uh, agriculture uses a lot of triazoles as one of the uh, predominant fungicides, especially on cereal grains. And we know from uh, algae blooms and everything else that runoff from agriculture into our oceans uh, is having an effect. So simultaneously with ability to grow at warmer temperatures, uh, um, triazole resistance is fairly common in, in Canada Oris. It can also develop resistance on therapy uh, because of this, um, uh, these mutations. And so you need to follow it while uh, treating to make sure that it stays uh, sensitive and you're getting good efficacy in your treatment. But uh, from the IDSA guidelines uh, for all can invasive Canada species, they recommend starting with an echinocandid. The IDSA guidelines do say in somebody with Canada uh, albicans, no previous exposure to fluconazole or azoles, that you could consider fluconazole as your initial um, uh, treatment, but pretty much for invasive Canada, you know, I usually start with an echinocandin. Unfortunately, those are only uh, IV. Uh, next slide. The European guidelines um, uh, do, you know, recommend uh, initial Canada, invasive Canada treatment with a kind of candens. And for Canada Oris, that would also be acceptable uh, for initial therapy to start with a kind of candid. Uh, next slide. So uh, just to touch bases back to our clinical questions. So what are the risk factors for Canada Oris? So certainly, you know, scuba diving for uh, off the coast of uh, India, South Africa, uh, may be considered a risk factor. However, in this country, what we're really seeing is exposure to the healthcare environment, uh, increased uh, comorbidities. Um, and as Liz mentioned, you know, Canada uh, in general is a colonizer of our mucosal surfaces. You know, um, uh, oral pharynx, our uh, GI mucosal barrier, and also our upper respiratory tract. And as a colonizer, uh, our body doesn't necessarily care if it's there. And an infection is when the body starts to care. So the other risk factor, other than exposure to the healthcare environment, such as long-term care facilities, especially long-term acute care hospitals or ventilator hospitals, um, uh, plastic, you know, uh, like a tracheostomy, uh, is an invasive procedure. That's where you can take uh, colonized organisms and cause a deep infection. As Liz pointed out, deep lines and surgical procedures on the GI tract are major risk factors for all of uh, can invasive Canada species. And the same is true for Canada Oris. So if you're uh, exposed to it, colonized, and have a tracheostomy, uh, uh, a, a, a surgical procedure, you can make that uh, uh, colonized organism now invasive. So also, uh, as Liz uh, uh, set me up for, in the case that I mentioned, uh, there was not good evidence that this was an infection. It was likely a colonizer for of his tracheostomy. So in that setting, as are most of the uh, identification in respiratory uh, cultures, 
uh, treatment is generally not necessary. And after you know, 25, 30 years of ID, I probably only considered it, it a true pathogen in less than a handful. So very extraordinary cases uh, uh, in the respiratory tract. Also pointed out, uh, we're entering the era of susceptibility testing. Um, not all of our, our breakpoints have good clinical breakpoints uh, for fungal diseases. And uh, we need to take a lot of our, our susceptibility testing with a grain of salt. But I do use MICs and the knowing the mechanism of action of our antifungals. Um, and as I am um, happy to help out with base of Canada um, infections, I also ask our uh, pharmacologists, um, uh, pharmacists, for help with available uh, medications and what are achievable uh, MICs. So I do use uh, susceptibility testing for invasive isolates. Uh, initial uh, treatment recommendations, a kind of candid, uh, as mentioned. So infection prevention uh, in this uh, organism is huge because uh, of its potential uh, drug resistance, uh, we really try to contain both colonized or infected uh, patients. So contact and standard precautions, environmental cleaning uh, are, are very important in all this. We don't, um, with close contacts with patients, patients share rooms, things like that, screening other patients uh, is likely, or in cases of an institutional outbreak. Uh, we're not really screening uh, uh, family members per se or other uh, casual contacts. It's very important to let any transferring uh, or um, institutions where a uh, patient is going to be transferred, like a nursing home, a dialysis center, long-term care center, or inter-hospital transfer, to really uh, give them a heads up that, that this organism is uh, uh, present in your patient, notify your, your local uh, hospital, um, and as a reportable uh, condition, uh, eventually up to the CDC.